Life before the Palm Pilot. Organizers, Filofax was once a small binder full of paper. One section for your agenda diary, one for your dress book, scrapbook section, a section at the back where you jam all your loose leaf paper, but was a bit bulky and not the most secure. Then came these organizers. Press here for your calendar, press here for your schedule, address book, memo, calculator, world time, home time, and even expansion cards. But for a portable organizer, the bulk really started adding up. Then along came the Palm Pilot, the first true modern PDA to have what we have taken for granted these days, apps, and it didn't even add extra bulk to your pocket. A reason why the Palm was so popular was that it was actually pocketable compared to what was commonly available in the mid-90s. Oftentimes the key to creating a great product is not what you put in, but what you leave out. Ironically, Palm's initial pilot was laughably underpowered compared to the Newton. The Newton had an unreliable handwriting recognition and had very poor user experience. Meanwhile, Palm gave instant access to commonly used items such as diary, phone book, to-do list and notes. Zen of Palm was focusing on user experience instead of the feature list. This design philosophy is a given today, but back then, with limited computing power, designers, or more so engineers, were more focused on cramming as many features as possible within the given constraints. This is not dissimilar to comparing the shopping experience between a cramped Asian grocery slash convenience store versus a upmarket boutique shop. So instead, Palm focused on how data can most efficiently be displayed, how long can the battery last, and will you carry it? Just look at it, it's so tiny. Palm's founder, Jeff Hawkins, realized that the more important than being packed with features, a personal digital assistant needed to be light and light enough that people felt comfortable carrying it with them everywhere. To keep this focus in mind, Jeff actually carried around a block of wood the size and weight of the eventual pilot. Quite a commitment. Back to the Palm Pilot. Here's what's in the box. A leather case, a Palm docking station with RS-232 connectors, and this doesn't charge the Palm Pilot. DB9 to DB25 serial converter. Back then, the DB9 port would have most likely been occupied by your mouse. And manuals. Lots of manuals. The full Palm Pilot manual. A manual just for the email and PC connectivity. A quick start guide to the Palm Pilot. An even smaller, more abbreviated quick start guide. An installation CD with the Palm Pilot. An accessory catalogue. A pamphlet for how to order at Palm Pilot accessories. Technical support. Palm Pilot disc offers. A free stylus offer, I'm about a few years late. A little quick reference guide to the graffiti. Some graffiti stickers to remind you of the symbols you need to learn to draw to enter text. And a pair of AAA batteries that keeps the Palm Pilot going for a whole month. Now what really made the Palm Pilot shine in its day was the number of third-party apps available. A common one I used to use was the Train Timetable app. Bear in mind, this was when we didn't have fully connected mobile phones. Also, train timetables weren't available on the WAP portal. Well, not in Australia back then anyway. I managed to find a very similar app I used back then. It's called Train Schedule. Now, imagine you're back in the 90s, heading back to the train station, listening to your Discman. That's a portable CD player for those not around in the 90s. You need to decide whether to take the ferry or the bus, since you need to get to the other side of the harbour. So you whip out your Palm Pilot, and within a few seconds, you have the train or ferry schedule in front of you. Granted, this isn't anything special today, but bear in mind, before this, you'd have to dig through your bag, find your paper organizer, flip through the sections, find the tiny little pamphlet with the bus schedule, and then look it up, all the while while not dropping it and holding and balancing your bag. Not hard, just inconvenient. Now, what to do when you're on the train? If you didn't bring any reading material, there's always the window you can stare out of. You could bring a book, but the Pine Pilot has an e-reader app, Okay, so the 6x6 centimeter screen is obviously going to pale in comparison to a high resolution 6 inch screen of today's smartphones. But keep in mind, this was still much more portable than carrying around a paperback back in the 90s. Remember how this Palm Pilot has 1 megabyte of RAM, and of that, 960k is available to the user. The average book was about 700k, so if you want to carry a book around, it would use up about 70% of your non expandable storage. This is not too bad as Palm apps were tiny back then. Most of them were around 20 to 50k. This version of Palm Pilot, you can carry around a book and a handful of apps, which were enough for most users. This became less of a problem with the later Palms. For example, the Palm 3 had 2 meg. 
and the Palm M500 series even had up to 16 meg with expandable SD storage on top of that. There was also mobile gaming back in the 90s. We had Snake on our phones, but that was it. Addictive as it was, there wasn't much else. The main portable gaming in the mid-90s was in the form of the Game Boy. Yes, there was the Color Sega Game Gear, which was a battery killer, the Atari Lynx, which didn't see much support, and there was a few others with even less exposure in Australia. So for the sake of simplicity, we'll compare with the Game Boy, as it was common, had a decent battery life, relatively compact, good number of games, and a 160x144 monochrome screen, which was similar to the Palm Pilot's 160x160. On the Palm Pilot, we had a relatively large library of apps to choose from. A common download was chess. But for the hardcore gamers, we had Dragon Bane, 3D RPG adventure on the Palm, complete with immersive beeps and boops. This was courtesy of that mono buzzer. It had no voice capabilities and it had no music capabilities. In fact, the Palm had no multimedia capabilities at that time. And it wasn't until much, much later that Palms introduced multimedia. Third-party apps won't be the focus of this video, as it'll be a whole video in itself, given how many apps there were and how it changed the landscape back then. There was almost a Palm Pilot app for everything you could think of. Almost. Here we see how the first gen fared out with its competition compared to today. Well, Second gen technically, but the first gen was upgradable to almost identical specs, bar the backlight. So yeah, first gen. Let me know what you think in the comments. The third party support was definitely one of the main reasons it became seen as a predecessor to today's app-based phones. Centralized app store? Nope, sorry, no central app store in the mid-90s. You had to go to each vendor site and purchase from them separately. Example, documents to go, Plico dictionary. You had to be a bit more proactive with your app hoarding back then. There were a few notable mentions or competition, previously known as Epoch on the Scion devices. Nokia's Symbian made a good effort, but there were malware issues. So then comes the signing of the apps, which made the installations difficult as only a few organizations could afford the certificates. So third party apps and smaller devs had to make do with self-signing, which stops access to things like Bluetooth, infrared, GSM, cell ID, voice calls, GPS, and a few others. But you get the idea. It severely crippled the third-party development. Windows CE seemed promising, but it was quite sluggish. There were few people that managed to get a reasonably smooth experience out of their CE devices, but they were reasonably technical people, and it still wasn't as snappy as the Palms. Granted, the target audience might have been a bit different. Palm was more of a personal PC companion. It absolutely needed a PC to function, whilst the other ones were trying to be just smaller independent devices such as the HP 300LX, it was almost self-sufficient. Much like the Palm Tops before it, it didn't really add much in terms of usability or functions over its predecessors. The other Palm Tops before, note the word Palm Top. It was trying to be a small portable office. You have a word processor? I have a word processor. You have a spreadsheet? I have a spreadsheet. Agenda? Me too. But it's all miniaturized cut down versions from the desktop. Given how big laptops were back then, it's totally understandable why they made that move. They weren't even called laptops, they were called portables. This feature, however, became less relevant as laptops were becoming smaller and smaller. Palm, on the other hand, was not trying to be a portable office. It was more along the lines of a portable data bucket. Although in later years, Palm got an office suite and wireless connectivity. Speaking of connectivity, the serial port was how the Palm Pilot's connected to the world, via your PC. You can download your data, such as calendar, phone book, to-do list, and memos, just like all the other PDAs of the day, the ones that support PC synchronization anyway. But this is also how you get apps on there too, all through the mighty serial port. For the true road warriors of the 90s, we have the Palm modem, and allows you to cloud sync back to your desktop wherever you are. It was indeed quite portable and powered by a pair of AAA batteries. This allowed you to sync from any phone port in the world, if you could find one. Here we have set up a fake telephone network as we no longer have analog phone service here in Australia anymore. Meanwhile, on the desktop that the Palm will be dialed into, we have a modem attached. Making sure that the modem is selected, this setup would have usually required a separate line because if the fax picked up before your computer does, then your Palm Pilot would end up talking to the faction machine and never get synced. 
Now, assuming you found a phone port while you were out and about, let's send and receive some emails. Here's a challenge. Guess how fast the modem is syncing based on the screeches of the tiny Palm Pilot modem. For those unaware, there's going to be screeching noises soon. Like nails on blackboards mixed with static. We didn't have connected devices back then. When we wanted to get online, we had to connect as we needed, and then disconnect afterwards. As some of you may remember, we had to tell the whole household we were going online so our connection wouldn't get dropped if somebody picked up the house phone. This was especially painful for those who didn't have flat rate local calls. Right, let's see what emails came in while we were out of the office. Of course, people didn't send and receive emails as spontaneously as we do now. Normally you would accumulate a few email replies and send them all at once, maybe a couple of times a day if you were out and about. I mean, even the Sharp Zorus ZR5800 had email, although it was buried under tools and it seemed more like an afterthought. It was also restricted to a handful of providers, most of which weren't available in Australia. But to me, this pocket wonder was the first PDA to change how organizers became personal with your set of apps that you used and had a modern app functionality as we know of today. In fact, I was still using the Palm Pilot even into 2006, albeit under the guise of the Palm Trio 650. Today, most of us wouldn't consider buying a phone that couldn't access third-party apps and games, no matter how good the built-in apps were. It would be very limiting. But that was how it was in the 90s, which was what made the Palm so liberating. Thanks for watching, and thanks for joining me on this nostalgic trip down memory lane.